Legends of music right here on Dubai I 103.8. We don't use the word legends lightly, but um, on this interview, I think I'm going to be dropping that word in quite a lot as we have the incredible Niall Rogers joining us on the show ahead of his gig here in Dubai on the 4th of November, at blah, blah. Niall, thank you so much for being with us. It's a real honor for us. How are you? Oh, man, I'm really well, Mark. How are you, man? Good, sir. So I want to get started um, with what we can expect from uh, an R. Rogers sheet gig. Um, I, I, I think everybody will be dancing on that night. Just, just tell our listeners what, what they can expect when they come along to see you. So most of the music I do um, doesn't become a hit. Uh, it's, you, you know, yep, yep. I am one of the very lucky uh writers and producers and guitarists who uh i usually get to do the entire album i don't just do one song here and there yeah yeah, yeah. most of the modern the modern producers do a song here and there and uh i think record labels believe that it's almost like going to a casino and putting chips on uh, Mm. uh, you know like uh, spreading it around uh, whereas I come from the school of uh, an album is like a film and I want a, an artist to make a complete statement. So the abundance of songs that I've done are not hits, but I've actually had a lot of hits, even though I've played on that hundreds of songs <laughs> with the hit maker. Remember, yeah. I got that guitar in 1973. <laughs> Can you remember <laughs> buying it? I remember buying it very well. 1973, oh my goodness. Uh, if only you'd have known how many songs it was going to appear on. I want to ask you as well about the collaboration with your friend and, and, and great musician, Bernard Edwards. Between you, you created some of the greatest dance grooves of all time. Tell me about Bernard. He um, he, he was everything to me. He, he taught me... Um, to not just make music for myself, but to make music for others. And that was an interesting concept because uh, all my life, I had believed in these artists who were basically sort of (laughs) self-centered. I I thought that these (laughs) geniuses were like, you know, they allowed you to come into their world. Uh, Bernard taught me we should invade your world. (laughs) And I was like, wow, I never thought of it like that. I remember having a conversation with David Bowie and asking him, hey, David, do you think about your audience when you write music? He said, absolutely not. And I was like, wow. And this was after me having, you know, at least a dozen hit records. And and I kept thinking, wow, that's so weird. You know, David Bowie, you're like this huge superstar. Um, and I am very concerned with my audience when I write a song. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I even said to him at the time, I said, man, it must be amazing to be white because at, in those days, I there was only one radio station that could guarantee me a hit record in America, um, or at least living in the New York area. Um, so if I didn't get on that radio station, I didn't have a hit. So I had to think about my audience. I had to think yeah. about format. David just wrote from what, <laughs> what he felt with his heart. So I had to take my heart and and figure out a way, okay, I have to write from my heart because I can't do it any other way. But then after I do that, now I have to rewrite it and make sure that I'm trying to now invade or at least occupy space in your heart. We are talking to the incredible Nile Rogers, who just mentioned the name of David Bowie there, which was going to be my next question. You've worked with so many, Daft Punk, of course, uh, more recently, Sister Sledge, Dana Ross, but David Bowie and Let's Dance, what an iconic record that is. Of course, Stevie Ray Vaughan on there as well. Just tell me your recollections of making that record. It was, and people find this hard to believe, it was the easiest record I've ever made in my life. Easier than any any record. Really? The entire, yeah, the entire record was done in 17 days. And his family, the, the Bowie's estate, sent me a thumb drive 
And I had forgotten this, but I did every uh, demo and um, uh, and laid out all the arrangements in two days in Switzerland. So by the time we got to America to do the actual real album, we just played what I had already laid out and we just went right through it. The only thing that we did at the very end was we wrote a song called Ricochet, David and I in the studio, and then he played China Girl for me. And wow. I was like, oh, wow. why didn't you play that before? Um, <laughs> every, everything else I did in two days, the whole album. So yeah. 17 days, start to finish. There's never been um, any outtakes. There's Every song is one take. Um, that, that's It was the easiest record I've ever done in my life. Incredible. Now, uh, let's get to some disco, some solid uh, disco and, the, you know, the likes of Sister Sledge, We Are Family, Good Times from Chic. Um, I mean, it, you were just a hit making factory at that time, weren't you? I mean, were they easy songs to write or, you know, was it quite complex? Um, some were more difficult than others, but because everything I do is based on a non-fictional event, um, you know, I have uh, an interesting starting point right away because it's something that I've witnessed in real life or something that I felt no matter how trite the song may sound to the listener, like, oh, I'll freak out. Well, that was a real event that happened. We tried to get into Studio 54. Grace Jones had invited us. We had already been to Studio 54 a bunch of times. Why would they not let us in this particular night? Well, because Grace told us to go to the to the artist door, which we had never been in. <laughs> and we always went in the front door. And it yeah. was New Year's Eve. And the guy slammed the door in our faces and said, ah, F off. So we wrote, went home and wrote, ah, F off. Dun, 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 F Studio 54. Turned in the freak out. So we had a non-fictional event that turned that we used fictional elements to complete the story but that's every record i've ever done so some of them the the non-fictional element may be quite complicated and and once again like i said i have to do uh, i have to write from my own heart but then have to figure out a way to uh invade if you will or um to, uh, and i and i do say invade because I know that you have to make space. I don't want to get too technical, but hmm. when I was going to music school, they talked about internalization. And you have to, you, in, in order to internalize a song, a person sort of has to make space. They have to move something else out of the way so that this particular song gets in their head and gets in their consciousness. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so that's what I have to do. I always think that, okay, now I have to come up with something that's going to actually move something over a little bit to the side so that you can walk around singing, we are family, I got all my sisters with me, um, you know, or right. or like Cuff it, you know. What's, um, been, what's, been, what's been your most commercially uh, successful record, uh, uh, Niall? You know, the one that really just hit the, the the sky the sky's the limit when it comes to commercial so, sales so the album that's my most successful is madonna's like a virgin yeah. um the single that's my most successful is le freak ah oh, freak out i mean yeah. there is nothing in the history of atlantic records that i don't believe will ever touch le freak for a certain amount of time uh the artist florida caught up with us uh, but now because of streaming, um, uh, Le Freak has just gone on to, well, it had already been the biggest single in Atlantic history, uh, but Florida did catch us a little bit. Um, Bruno Mars came close, but didn't really catch up. And now um, Le Freak is just flying. I mean, it's it's you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's been sampled on, on many a record a, a, as well. Um, I mean, all these collaborations that you've that you've done, we've mentioned Duran Duran, Madonna, uh, Sister Sledge. Is there anyone around these days in, you know, this generation that you would love to collaborate with, uh, Niall? I am actually doing that right now, and I can't you mention can't it. You can't tell me. <laughs> I, have, I have to wait until they announce it first. Okay. But it's it could you could easily call uh, 
this act and you could probably figure it out. Uh, I won't confirm it, but some people say they're the biggest band in the world. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it, it, you know, my, these, these accomplishments have gone way beyond my dreams. I, when I was just a kid sitting on the edge of my bed, learning, yeah. you know, songs and, you know, I was fortunate to have learned to read music at a very early age. So learning songs was easy, uh, but then composing was different. And when I realized that composing was what it was all about for me, I just dreamed of having one hit record. God knows that, that I've surpassed my dreams a million fold. I, I would have never believed that I would have dozens of hit records. Yeah. I mean, dozens. And I believe that with what I'm doing this year, um, I'll probably, you know, get three or four more. Wow. Wow. I can't you know, wait to hear who that, that is going to be. I, I mean, when it comes to live performances, it was so looking forward, of course, to the 4th of November here at Blah Blah to see you and Sheik on stage. Uh, do you still get the same buzz? Do you still enjoy uh, doing live gigs now? It's It may be more fun because in the old days, I was completely introverted and I probably am pretty much the same kind of person now. The only difference is that uh, for a short while, I had a television show and my my floor director taught me to look at the audience as um, they said, imagine it's the one person in your family that absolutely loves you and wants to see you do well. Yeah. So when I walk out on stage now, I look out at all those people, be it a million or a hundred thousand or 40,000 or 50,000 or 10,000 or even 2000. Um, I look at those people as that one person in my life who, uh, I'll, and I'll tell you my secret. It's, it's my, my maternal grandmother. <laughs> I, I look out there and I say, those are all people who really want me to do well. Yeah. And they love me and they go, Oh, sweetie you did a good job so <laughs> <You're> that... <laughs> doing a great job i just want to find out a little bit about nile rogers when he's not holding his guitar and when he's not in his studio what 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 do you do in your downtime now uh roller skate uh and i've really? unfortunately oh yeah 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 my exercise routine until i uh yeah i developed a torn meniscus so i have to wait for another i think three or four months i i had stem cell uh treatment um, about two, three months ago. And they said, I have to, it'll take about six months to repair. But um, yeah, my normal exercise routine is I, I walk eight miles in the morning and I skate 10 miles every morning around five, six o'clock. Wow. That's absolutely incredible, um, Niall. Uh, just to wrap up, I mean, what what are you working on now? You've mentioned this big band that you're collaborating with. Anything you can tell us about for, for the future? Is there more touring on the horizon? Um, yeah, that will, I'll never stop touring. As I said uh, at the beginning of this, that uh, all of my heroes played up until they couldn't play any longer. Yeah. Uh, why would I stop doing that? Like as I said, I was I was in the orchestra at Carnegie Hall. Um, for Nina Simone's last concert. Wow. She played until she couldn't play anymore. And that was, I was, that was like such a huge honor for me to be there that night. And um, I want to be that person. I want to play until I can't do it any longer. Yeah. You mentioned Nina Simone as one of your heroes. Any, any more that, you know, that you really respected and influenced you and you looked up to? Oh yeah. And, and I've gotten, you know, the opportunity to work with them, Herbie Hancock, wow. um, uh, uh, Wayne Shorter, yeah. uh, Carlos, Carlos Santana. Um, and that was all in the same gig, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, I mean, so, so many, it's, it's, it, yeah. it's, like, it's incredible. I mean, look, I mean, think about this. I, I, I've done Diana Ross's 
biggest selling record. I've done Sister Sledge's biggest selling record, Bowie's biggest selling record, like like a virgin, Madonna's biggest selling record, my biggest selling record. Uh, most of the albums that I do with artists winds up becoming their biggest selling. If we get a hit, the B-52s, their biggest selling, Duran Duran, their biggest selling, you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. That, that's my, I guess that's my legacy that when I get it right, it's the most right that I can get. Um, and that, and that's incredible to me uh, because most of the time, it's not that you get it wrong. It's just that you have to be part of not just a headline, but you have to be part of a trend line. So sometimes you're not part of the trend line. Sometimes the zeitgeist is different than where you are with that particular artist. And you know, um, like, you know, when when I won all those Grammys for for Daft Punk, you know, the guys all looked at me and said, oh, no, this must be old hat for you. I said, "You can you believe this is the very first Grammy I ever won? They were like, what are you talking about? You didn't win. Let's dance. And I said, no, you got to remember, Let's Dance came out the same year as Thriller. <laughs> we didn't have a chance. Big conversation there. <laughs> Niall, you've been wonderful to chat to. Finally, maybe you can invite um, our listeners of Dubai I-103.8 to come along to your gig on the 4th of November. Oh, by all means, please come to the gig. You are going to have the time of your lives. We we give everything. We our shows um, are almost sacred to us. Uh, we believe in we're out there for the audience, and and it's a party. We've we've never done a show that's not a party. The 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 audience is uh, just as much involved as the uh, just in, as much involved as for the success of the show yeah, yeah. as the people are on, <clears throat> pardon me as the people are on stage i mean so the audience is an integral part of our gig so we want everybody to come out that's straight from the voice of the one and only Mr. Nile Rogers, an absolute legend. You've freaked me out tonight, Niall, um, <laughs> chatting with you. It's been wonderful, and we can't wait to see you in the city of Dubai. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark.